Okay. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective, either virtually or IRL. Uh, mm -hmm. And tonight's a special night. Uh, in fact, I thought we'd do something different tonight. I thought we'd talk about how to alleviate suffering. How does that sound? <laughs> of course, of course, I'm just kidding. We talk about that every Sunday night, but we might have lost sight of that, which is why I wanted to start with that comment. The sutra we've been working on, the ideas that we've been working on here on Sunday nights, they've gotten pretty deep, pretty profound. And tonight I kind of want to reel things in a little bit, at least on my end by attempting to make uh, at least the Dharma talk portion of tonight a little more accessible, a little more applicable to the basics of, of Dharma, the basics of Buddhism. But we are going to dive back into our sutta, or our, I should say our sutra. Um, yeah, so the theme for tonight, since Sunday nights now have a theme, the theme for tonight, and I wrote it down, is Shunyata, otherwise known as emptiness, everybody's favorite topic. I will let you know, though, that I'm also going to be talking a lot about animita, which is translated as, you might know it as signlessness. I refer to it as characteristiclessness. Um, we'll talk about that. And then even a third... <laughs> This one, apranihita, aimlessness. So these three, those three words, <clears throat> those are actually what are often referred to as the three doors of liberation. And right on that note, in terms of a, of a, a gateway, a doorway, an entryway to liberation, they're talking about the liberation from suffering. <laughs> They're talking about liberation from the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. They're talking about the Dharma in that way. So tonight, again, I'm going to be talking about all three of those ideas. We're going to focus on the first one, the idea of emptiness. And I'm going to start tonight with sort of a Dharma talk about that idea of shunyata. Again, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with it, this sh, shunyata, sometimes it's translated as voidness. I'm not a huge fan of voidness. I'm gonna stick with emptiness tonight. Um, yeah, and so let's start to get into the Dharma. So, one place that I want to start, and I, I, I probably shouldn't even do this, but I really want to. I'm going to actually pick up where we left off last week, just with one idea. So last week, the theme was tathata, <clears throat> suchness, or thusness, or as it isness, and. The basic idea, of course, is that this idea of tathata that we talked about last week, it's a way of being, a way of experiencing reality, where reality is experienced as thus, as being such. And what I sort of, you know, last week was a big Dharma talk about that idea. And in talking about this idea of things as they are, as, as such, I want to begin with sort of making a, a distinction. So when I talk about, when uh, Buddhism talks about thusness, suchness, it's not talking about accepting things as they are. Although it could seem like that, 
And what I mean is, and, and let me give you an example, and I might try to stick with this example for the evening, you never know. But the idea here is, is I wanna be thinking about, let's imagine that there's somebody, somebody who is making us angry, right? Maybe they're uh, their behavior or what they're saying or whatever it is, but there's a way in which they are getting me angry, pissing me off with their whatever they're doing. So <clears throat> the idea here is, is that you might think that suchness or thusness is about just accepting that this person is a jerk. <laughs> but that's not thusness actually at all, at all, at all. And again, that's where I wanna to start tonight, even though this is kind of taking a step back to go forward. Again, this idea of suchness or thusness, it's not about just accepting things as they are or as they seem in that way. It's a lot deeper than that. And that's gonna bring us to this topic of emptiness tonight. Emptiness and suchness, shunyata and tathata, they have a lot to do with each other. So in order to make this clear about how is it that suchness or thusness isn't just about accepting things as they are, but it's actually a different way of understanding. I, I dare not even call it a different way of seeing because seeing implies a seer. Seeing implies this kind of subject object relationship, which we're always talking about being problematic in that way. So I just wanted to put that there and we're gonna get back to it. And I'm gonna get back to this person who's doing these things that's making us angry and like how to work with that, if you will. So with that on the side, let's talk about emptiness. So I talk about emptiness practically every Sunday night. It's, it's just one of those topics that, especially if you're a teacher like me, that's kind of, um, kind of focused on Mahayana Buddhism, it's emptiness is the name of the game. So really quickly, in case you don't know, or you haven't been coming to Dharma doors, or it's still a little unclear, this teaching about emptiness, it's so, so subtle, so, so profound, really, truly. So it has, a, it, again, it a, has a lot to do with the way that we think, the way that we understand. And to put it really simply, and this is, I've been struggling with this all day, how could you really put emptiness very simply? So the idea is, is that what I'm about to talk about, of course, this teaching of emptiness, it goes for anything, anything no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how uh, physical or mental, if it's an emotion, if it's a color, if it's a whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. Everything I'm about to say applies to, to that <laughs> because it has to do with this, well, this is where it gets tricky because we're wrestling with language itself to try to talk about something that's a bit elusive. So what it has to do with, and it, this is actually some really, you know, deep philosophy. It's why I wanted to tell you, we're going to try to make this very practical, but I just got to tell you, it's a deep idea. So, you know, I could choose any number of these, my prop, my props, right? I got cups and clocks and this and that. It doesn't matter though, again, because the idea here is, is that when we begin to inquire 
about the nature of something. And again, this is where I want to show you something, but I don't because I don't want you to already start to conceptualize it. I want to stay kind of very vague. But my point is, is that there's a grand presumption that goes on with any kind of thinking. And what that grand presumption is, is that if we wanted to investigate something, like what it is, how would we do that? Meaning, when I look at something, how would I distinguish it from something else, right? And maybe now I do need a, a prop. <laughs> I, I was going to try to do this prop list, but so let's take these two. So the point is, is that you might have an idea of what that is, and you might have an idea of what that is. And you probably don't think that this is one of these. You, you think this is one of those, and this is one of those. Well, but how, how would you, what, what makes you do that? What makes you differentiate these two? Could it be their characteristics? Because this one has that characteristic black and the big circle. This one has that characteristic mirror-like surface with the small circle. So it's this small circle and the mirror-like surface versus the bigger circle. So it's these characteristics that you're using to say, oh yeah, that's a CD, a compact disc, and that's a record, a vinyl record. So what I want you to notice is, is that in determining what this is, you rely upon its characteristics. What we're interested in, though, is what is black with a big circle in it? What, what is? And if you tell me the record, I'm going to ask you how you knew it was a record. And you're going to tell me because it, it was black with the big circle. And then I'm going to ask you again, what is black with the big circle <laughs> and you're going to tell me it's a record and we're going to be in this loop forever of what is being called a record and don't tell me the record because again that's tautological and so that idea of what is being called a record like, what is the thing that is being called a record? And the idea here is, is that, as we've talked about in the past, this, of course, is not singular. There's the label. There's this piece of paper or sticker adhesive. So this is, of course, not part of the record. But then we could also start to talk about the groove, the grooves of the record. And are the grooves sort of different than the record or are they the same as the record? But if you, because if you didn't have grooves, meaning if it was just a piece of black vinyl, it wouldn't be a record because it wouldn't make music. You couldn't put it on a record player. So the grooves, are what make it a record, right? So are the grooves and the record the same thing or two different things? And all I'm trying to do right now is really, really complicate what is underneath all of these descriptions, all of these labels, 
all of these characteristics. What's, what's underneath that is black? That's a record that you could play that all of these things. And the idea is, is that there isn't any thing, meaning any one thing. There are, in a, in a sense, and this is where this is about to get very, very tricky, it's this sort of confluence of things. But what the mind or a mind can do is just hold something as one thing as one object. And then as soon as we've got an object, ah, now we can get busy labeling said object with these characteristics and a use value, perhaps an aesthetic value. So all of these characteristics on top of something, Emptiness, this teaching about shunyata, is about the presumption of there being something. So on that note, and since it's early, I'll, I'll, I'll drop this on you. I just want to give you a little taste. This might not be for everybody, but I think it'll be for some. So... This is, this is a great little book, has nothing to do with Buddhism, but if you're interested in ideas and you're interested in these ideas, you might find it interesting. So this is just a cool little book. It's a, a collection of essays by this guy, Giorgio Agamben. He's a pretty famous living modern day Italian philosopher. And he wrote a book called What is Philosophy? And it's a collection of essays. And I just want to read to you one little part from his book. Now, he doesn't get into emptiness, but he gets into this, this exact area. So what he says is, is in this opening essay, which is actually about language, it's about like, what do we do with language? And what he says is, Anything we name or conceive of is already somehow presupposed in language by reason of the simple fact of being named. I could go on and on. It goes on for pages. But right there is a very interesting thing that anything that we name, it's already somehow been presupposed or preconceived of in terms of language in that way. And that's what I was getting at in terms of this, what is this? And you say, oh, it's a record. And I ask you, well, how did you know that? And you knew it because of it, these characteristics. But if I asked you, no, 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 what is being called a record? We reach the end of language. Meaning that we can't say it, 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 it confronts itself. I, I don't, I'm, I'm running out of words to explain this very idea, but it's about, so the, the divergence, by the way, this whole book, this wonderful little book, the divergence between Western philosophy and Buddhist philosophy, not all Eastern philosophy, but Buddhist philosophy, the divergence is that Western philosophy is still searching for what is being called a record. They're still trying to figure out what the entity or the object is at a molecular level, at a subatomic par particle level, in all kinds of ways, there is still a kind of a pursuit for what's underneath all of these words, what's underneath all of these labels and descriptors. And so Western philosophy and definitely Western science 
is still digging around trying to get to the bottom of phenomena. Whereas what the Buddha realizes, what Nagarjuna realized, what the Mahayana tradition realizes is that the idea that there's a subject, meaning the idea that there is one thing that we're talking about is a presumption. And as soon as you understand that idea, you realize, oh, there's nothing underneath all of this. It's a kind of house of cards of ideas, a house of cards of words and concepts that are all in relationship to each other. But underneath them all, there's no bhava, there's no svabhava, is what they call it in Sanskrit, no inherent nature or inherent thing in that way. And so emptiness is this realization or this teaching about that there's no singularity, there's no individual entity or object anywhere. And what happens is, and now I might, the record one, the record one is a little tricky, but if I show you this one, this Dharma, this object, the idea here is, is that the singular object, the clock, well, what is being called a clock? And don't tell me the clock. <laughs> What is being called a clock? And I know it, you might think that pile of plastic, that pile of plastic stuff in your hand, that's what we're calling a clock. How did you know it was a pile of plastic? Where are those words and ideas and concepts coming from? So emptiness isn't just about the one thing, it's actually about how the button that also is a singular concept and underneath empty. The hands, the face, the battery, they're all individual concepts and ultimately empty underneath. Now, the most important thing I can tell you about this at this point, or, or that I can kind of emphasize, is that emptiness doesn't mean not real or not existent or it's it's because look <laughs> but what we're interested in in terms of this idea of emptiness is about this again it's a presumption that there's something underneath all of that so the really now what i want to do is everybody doing okay with this emptiness idea cool yeah jenny So we're recognizing things to define it. Does function, because our mind looks at the clock to see what time it is. Yep. Right? So that's a different, is that a different kind of recognizing the thing? <clears throat> so use or function is a very interesting one. It's a very interesting characteristic. So if I show you this again, and you think there's one thing in my hand, just one, you probably call it a clock. Again, what are we calling a clock? I don't know. But now the idea is, is that the clock is red. So that's a characteristic. It's a small clock that fits in my hand. That's a characteristic. And its use, its function is a characteristic. So, but here's a funny one, Jenny. Thank you, by the way, for this great question. So, <clears throat> Is that a clock? <laughs> it's just three o'clock. Like any broken clock, you're right. This is going to be right twice a day. 
<laughs> but let's, okay, besides that, I ask again, is this a clock though? And the idea, of course, is that it's awfully thin. <laughs> These hands are not moving. And so is it a clock? Now, Jenny, what I'm riff riffing on here is this idea of function or use. And right now you say, well, it doesn't function. It doesn't function like a clock. So it's not a clock. Does that make sense? It's a piece of paper. Yeah, because that would be its function is I drew I drew on it. So its function is to do that. So you're telling me this is not a clock because it doesn't actually clock. It doesn't keep time, right? Well, guess what? This one's broken. It doesn't keep time either. So is this a clock? <laughs> You would at this point say, well, you know, it's a broken clock. And then again, I'd say, oh, this, this is a broken clock too. Because if, if, if we're calling something a clock, if it looks like a clock, even if it doesn't actually keep time, then this is a clock. So what I'm getting at, oh, and by the way, here's an interesting one for all you Aristotelian, all you Aristotelian philosophers out there. If we define something as what it is, like I just did, where I said, this is a piece of paper because I can write on it. So that's its function. Well, guess what? I could take anything, put a string on it and turn it into a pendulum and it would keep time. So at that point, take a look around. Everything is a clock because it all has the potential to function as a clock. So are we still interested in functionality as a defining characteristic of something? Because I, again, I could write on just about anything. Does that mean everything is a piece of paper? No. <laughs> all right, so function, <laughs> all of these ideas, the, the point that I want to come back to is that function, the use, the size, all of these things are being thrown onto what? <laughs> so I'm, keep, I'm going to keep coming back to this question. What's underneath all of this that we're throwing on the idea of a clock. We're throwing on the idea of red. We're throwing on the idea of a small thing. What is small? What's red? What's a clock? And the point again is, is that the mind presumes that there's something there. And emptiness is about that presumption that there is something there. Everybody follow me on that idea? So let's go back to this person that was bothering us, making us angry with their behavior. The reason why I said at the beginning that this idea of suchness or tathata it's not about accepting this person who is a jerk. Emptiness, first of all, is a teaching about how there is no singular person that is doing the behavior that you think, but your presumption that there is one person out there doing the thing, that's the presumption of a, of a subject. That's the presumption of there being something. And now it's a person, a human, a jerk, insensitive, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. So all of these characteristics are being thrown on top of shunyata, emptiness. There is no person underneath all of that. And guess what? In this scenario, where 
that person is making this person angry, the presumption that there is this one person, Michael, hi, that too is empty, meaning that presumption of the, of the self in that way. So at the beginning of the Dharma talk tonight, I said, let's talk about the alleviation of suffering. Getting angry is suffering by Buddhist definition. And so the alleviation of that, not being angry, not having the, the tight chest and the tight stomach and all of the symptoms of hate, of anger in that way, the idea is, is well, not suffering would be not having that. So the idea here is, is that there's a, a building up of all of this. And what I mean is, is this. Initially, there's the presumption that there's somebody there. That's that initial delineation of a singular entity that we're calling a person. Then there's the heaping of characteristics on top of that presumed entity. They're a jerk. They're insensitive. They're mean. So that's on top of the person. And then there's an even third layer, which is that that jerky mean behavior is making me angry and something needs to be done about all of this, meaning this person needs to stop or whatever it is. So what I'm getting at is, is that at the third level of this, there is a desire a wanting for something to happen, which is for this person to shut the hell up or whatever it is. So what I'm getting at is that these three doors of liberation, they are a little bit sort of progressive where you have to have something to begin with <laughs> that can have characteristics which can drive us in certain directions in that way. And so the liberation, the doors of liberation are about realizing that there isn't anything underneath all of those characteristics. And therefore, there is nothing to have said characteristics. That's the characteristiclessness or the animita. And since there is nothing there actually having the characteristics that I think, there is no desire for things to be one way or the other. Because we understand that there's no body to change their behavior. There is the suchness of the experience of all of that, which is the experience of feeling embodied, being angry about what I think is a person who I think is a jerk. And there is the suchness of all of that. But again, when we talk about tathata or suchness, it's not about accepting this person and accepting their jerky behavior and just kind of being cool with it. Because that's still preserving that you are cool with their behavior. And I've just been talking about how there is nobody there with that behavior for you desired for you to desire to be one way or the other. So we want to notice, and this is where I want to come all the way back to my initial kind of statements. Even though this stuff is very like deep or subtle or philosophical, we're really getting it to the heart, to the core at what drives behavior, what drives suffering in that sense. So I hope everybody's okay with all of that. Cool. Awesome. So that's just a little uh, preparation, I would say. <laughs> preparation for the sutra. So. Hmm. Noe. What, 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 so this is the origin of suffering? 
It is in that in the Mahayana tradition, the origin of suffering is sort of understood to be ignorance more so than the clinging and craving that you might be used to. Meaning that in the Hinayana, in the early form of Buddhism, craving or desire, that was the cause. And it is a cause of suffering. I'm not going to say it's not. But what the Mahayana realizes is that the very thing that we crave is empty. And if you have that wisdom, there's no room for the desire. There's no room for the craving. There's no crave what? Who? Cra who craves what? So great question, Noe, great comment. And notice that we are still talking about the alleviation of suffering. But just at this deeper level where we're going to kind of, in a way, nip it in the bud before it even arises to the point of craving in that sense. Awesome. OK, so if there's no more questions, comments. Again, this was all then kind of preparatory for returning to our sutra. So we're diving back into uh, Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra, where we've been in the middle of this dialogue between the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, Manjushri, and this other Bodhisattva, Lion Courage. And as I've mentioned now for a few weeks, this dialogue between these Bodhisattvas is very interesting. The first question that our Bodhisattva Lion Courage had for Manjushri was, when in the future will you become a Buddha? When will you attain enlightenment? When will your suffering be ended? And of course, the dialogue was about how there is no one. <laughs> so in the future, there's what future, Manjushri says. You can go back and check on that part of the conversation. But then the Bodhisattva Lion Courage shifts and asks about the past, which was when did the Bodhisattva Manjushri first generate bodhicitta and start heading towards Buddhahood? So when in the past did you first become a Buddhist or first become a Bodhisattva? And Manjushri has problems with the idea of a self in the past. And that leaves Bodhisattva Lion Courage to the present. Okay, Manjushri, if you're gonna avoid answering my question regarding the future, and if you're gonna avoid answering my question regarding the past, then right now, what's up <laughs> in that sense? So that's where we were, <clears throat> and Manjushri was giving his answer. And I wanna return just quickly to a, a part, just a little bit um, before we stopped. And it had to do with Manjushri talking about how things, phenomena, dharmas, how they neither are permanent nor impermanent. And this is a big, uh, big idea. It refers back to an early Buddhist idea from that Hinayana tradition, which is about the impermanence of all phenomena. The Buddha taught anicca, the impermanence of all things. <clears throat> things don't last forever. They're impermanent. But I also mentioned, I don't think it was last week, it might have been two weeks ago, I might have mentioned this, this Buddhist critique, it's the Buddhist problem with what is called the two extreme views. The extreme view of eternalism and the extreme view of 
nihility or annihilationism or nihilism. <clears throat> and really quickly, a quick summary of those, because it's kind of important. If we have something, whatever it is, uh, a Michael or a clock, the question is, does the clock, does Michael last forever and ever and ever eternally? Or does the clock fall apart and go out of existence? Does Michael fall apart and die and just go out of existence into nility, into annihilation? The Buddha has always, even in the Hinayana, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the Buddha has always described his teaching, described the Dharma, as a teaching that avoids the two extreme views. Now, the thing about it is, is that in the early Buddhist tradition, in the Hinayana, they were very focused, in many ways, they were only focused on the idea of a self and whether the self was permanent or impermanent. The self, by which they actually mean the Atman, the, the, the soul or the essence. And so we are either an eternal soul going through reincarnation after reincarnation after reincarnation forever and ever and ever and ever. Or when we die, we go out of existence. No more Michael. That's it. The Buddha said that regarding the self, his teaching avoids the two extreme views because there is no self. There is no Atman. And by recognizing or understanding that there is no Atman, well, then there's nothing to last forever and ever and ever, but there's also nothing that goes out of existence. If you, if you understand that, well, actually, that teaching about if, there's, if you understand that there's no self, then there's nothing to be permanent and eternal or anything to be impermanent and falling apart. They call that the teaching of the deathless. You tap into that teaching about no self and there is nobody to die. And therefore the fear of death, the fear of illness, the fear of loss, the fear of all of that stuff has no abode has no place if there is no self. So the early Buddhist teaching that avoided the two extreme views was about how there was no Atman, no self, and therefore no, no extreme view. However, in the early Buddhist tradition, there were, and because that tradition is still exists, there are in that tradition, the five aggregates the body of physicality, the blood, the bones, the sinews, the organs, the sensations, the perception, the habits, the samskara, and the consciousness. Those were phenomena that were impermanent, like everything else. And everything here is impermanent. And any form of attachment to this is going to be very disappointed. That's <laughs> all I can say. <laughs> any attachment to this body is going to be very disappointed. That's the idea. So the Buddha said, this is all impermanent. You really shouldn't be attached to it as if it were going to last forever. And if you are in tune with there not being a self, and in tune with the impermanence of all physical phenomena, that was the alleviation of suffering. And it is a path to the alleviation of suffering. 
In the Mahayana tradition, as we learn from the Heart Sutra, the five skandhas are empty. And so what the Mahayana Buddhist tradition does is it applies the same logic of no self to the skandhas and comes to this realization of total emptiness, the emptiness of all phenomena. There isn't even a physical body to fall apart and be impermanent. So the Mahayana is a little different in that regard, that it's not just the self that's an illusion, it's all individuated phenomena by virtue of being individuated, if that makes sense. All right, everybody follow me on all of that. Cool, so Manjushri introduces us to this, this idea that <clears throat> if you understand that all phenomena, all dharmas are neither permanent nor impermanent, then Manjushri asks the Bodhisattva, is there any increase or decrease? So this will be a good, uh, a good um, interjection. So the language of Dharma is neither increasing nor decreasing. This is also language that you might be familiar with from the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra also says phenomena neither arise nor cease are neither defiled nor pure and neither increase nor decrease. So the way that you can think about dharmas not increasing or decreasing, let's go back to that person who was being a real jerk with their behavior. What it would mean to think in terms of increasing or decreasing is that person getting even meaner and more of a jerk and more of a jerk? Or the idea that they might actually get nicer and nicer and nicer, meaning that they're, let's call it unvirtuous behavior, right? That would be a very Buddhist way to talk. This person's unvirtuous behavior, they're speaking harshly, they're being mean. So the idea is, is that we could talk about their behavior increasing and getting worse or decreasing, and in that sense, getting better. But we've just established that there isn't anyone there underneath that behavior. So, is there anyone getting more and more mean? Is there anyone getting less and less mean? The idea here is, is that to presume that it's getting better or worse is to presume that entity or that person. And the idea, again, going back to Noe's great question and the idea about the wisdom here, is it's about the wisdom of understanding, oh, there isn't any entity, any person there for the behavior to increase or decrease. There is just the suchness of the way it is at that moment, if that makes sense. Okay, so in terms of, since dharmas are neither permanent nor impermanent, is there any increase or decrease? Bodhisattva Lion Courage says, no, of course. There's no entity underneath in that way. Manjushri says, if a dharma, if something, neither increases nor decreases, this is called perfect. What is perfect? If one is unable to understand all dharmas, one then gives rise to differentiation. If one is able to understand all dharmas, then there will not be differentiation. 
if there is not differentiation, then there is no increasing or decreasing. If there is no increasing or decreasing, then this is equanimity. For this reason, if one sees form equanimously, this is the perfection of form. Sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, and all other phenomena are also like this. All right, everybody feeling okay? Again, that was, we've done that. That was last week. So then our bodhisattva says something very interesting. <clears throat> so then Lion Courage Bodhisattva says to Manjushri, the venerable, you, Manjushri, have attained the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all dharmas without a single thought of desiring to achieve correct, perfect enlightenment. That's what Manjushri said before. He said he doesn't seek enlightenment in the future. So that being the case, the Bodhisattva Lion Courage asks, why do you now then persuade others to move towards awakening? Great question. It's an amazing question, right? Everybody kind of get how amazing that question is? Mandushri says, in reality, I do not persuade a single sentient being to head for awakening. Why? Because sentient beings do not have any inherent existence. Because sentient beings are beyond having an inherent nature. If sentient beings could be found, well, then I would cause them to head for awakening. But since they cannot be found, there is no persuading. How is that? Because equanimity is without differentiation. It is not that equanimity searches for equanimity, for there is nothing to come about. For this reason, it is always said that one should observe all actions, all samskara, all conditioned behaviors, as having nowhere to come from and nowhere to go. This is called equanimity. This then is the nature of emptiness. And within the nature of emptiness, there is nothing to seek. Just like you asked me about having already attained the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena without a single thought of desiring enlightenment. Noble one, do you see that mind? Is it therefore this mind that attains awakening? Okay, so before we hear the answer, let's dissect a lot of good stuff in that paragraph. <clears throat> so Manjushri begins with a pretty classic Manjushri thing to say. What sentient beings? I don't see a single sentient being. So how could I persuade a single sentient being to pursue awakening, right? So right there, I wanna to return to this very, very profound idea of emptiness, but specifically the emptiness of sentient beings. <clears throat> so I've already mentioned it many, many times, I was talking about this person and the presumption that there's a person there. Man, uh, Manjushri says, I don't see a single sentient being, right? And then as he goes on, and I wanted to pick up on this, he says, yeah, of course, if, if, if there were sentient beings around, 
of course, of course, I'd, I'd encourage them to become awakened. But since I can't find a single sentient being around, I don't persuade anybody, right? There is no persuading. Why is that? <clears throat> because equanimity is without differentiation. This is what we keep hearing from Manjushri. Differentiating this from that, good from bad, here from there, up from down, all of the differentiations. Equanimity is without differentiations. It, it's not that equanimity seeks equanimity, which is a great quote there. <clears throat> For this reason, it is always said that one should observe all samskara, all conditioned behaviors, as having nowhere to come from and nowhere to go. That sentence is a much better way of saying what I was trying to say regarding this person's mean behavior. So the idea is, is that that mean behavior, the person speaking harshly, that would be a samskara. That would be, from a Buddhist point of view, a conditioned behavior to speak harshly. And so what Manjushri said regarding within equanimity, there's no differentiation. Also this idea of emptiness that we've been talking about. He says, for this reason, it's always said that one should observe that all samskara have nowhere to come from and nowhere to go. <clears throat> so the way to understand that, excuse me, <clears throat> so regarding samskara, habitual behavior, the idea is, <clears throat> is that you might think that there is this, um, well, it's about the idea of these habits of the mind and that we presume that there must be somebody who has those habits. <clears throat> and that wouldn't be if there was somebody to have said habits, if there was somebody to have those samskaras, then those samskaras would come from somewhere. They would, quote unquote, go somewhere. But if we understand everything that I've been kind of trying to lay out tonight regarding the emptiness of phenomena, all phenomena, including what would be perceived of as a sentient being. <clears throat> what I want you to be thinking about is this. Let's, let's walk through a little exercise. Imagine that you go to sleep and now you find yourself in a dream. But like all those good dreams, we think it's reality. And so in my dream that I think is reality, I see somebody and they're speaking harshly to me. <laughs> they're saying mean things and it's making me angry. The idea is, is that there isn't really a person there. You're in a dream. You're imagining that there's a person there. There's nobody talking to you, but you're imagining that somebody's talking to you. And what you're imagining that they are saying is harsh, critical speech about you, and it's making you angry. 
The point is, is that the experience of being angry, the experience of thinking that you are an embodied being in a world where there's this person who's speaking harshly, all of that is such. It is so. When you're having that dream, there's the feeling of being a person, the feeling of being angry, this person and what they're saying. Now, the reason why we can describe it as being such is because, again, there isn't a real person. There isn't even a real you with ears who's hearing these words that are making you angry. But there is the anger. There's this experience of all of that. <clears throat> so what I'm getting at is that suchness, last week's lesson about tathata, suchness or thusness, thusness is in light of emptiness. So that's why I said at the beginning, it's not about accepting things as they are, meaning just accepting that this person is a jerk and there's nothing I can do about it. That is not thusness because you are still preserving that there's somebody there. You're still preserving that they're speaking harshly to you. That's not thusness at all. That's called suffering. That's called be believing all of the reality in that way. So I want to make it really clear that thusness is a profoundly different way of experiencing reality, where it is, you're, it's being experienced as just thus. <laughs> and at that point, you can't call it good or bad. It is just such in that way. Meaning that in that dream, I can't call that person bad or mean. There is no, there is no person bad or mean. And again, insofar as in a dream, I feel embodied, like with ears and a face that this person is talking about, that's illusory too. That's a delusion too, in that sense. So all of that is empty, but there is still this anger and this suffering. Why? Not understanding that it's a dream. So again, going back, if we're in a dream, but we think it's reality, then I think that's a real person. And I think what they're saying is like coming from a mind that's thinking that way about me and it's making me angry. Notice that the anger and the suffering and all of that is arising because you don't know you're in a dream. If you did, you would realize you were being silly for being angry about non-existent words coming from a non-existent person. <clears throat> Buddhism, or at least Mahayana Buddhism in this case, is talking about how the nature of this reality that you're in right now is much closer to a dream than it is to what you would think of as a tangible reality. And the reason why it's much closer to a dream is because the mechanism that creates self and other, it's what's happening here too. So I often point this out about dreams. Dreams are a crazy place to practice because you can witness firsthand, especially if you're in a lucid state, probably only if you're in a lucid state, but what you can realize and see happening firsthand is how the arising of a sense of self comes from thinking there's not self, meaning thinking that there's something that is not you. 
So you get this co-arising of self as you're sort of pushing things away as not being you. So when you're in a dream and you're like, what's that? The mind that says, what's that? Creates the viewer, creates the idea of there being somebody on this end, seeing that on that end. And the idea here is, <clears throat> is that it's the same clock that you see in a dream that you're seeing right here. Meaning there isn't a clock here, but there is an impression and then a mind that thinks they're seeing a clock. And that's the exact same mechanism as in a dream. All right, Noe, I saw your hand a while ago. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you. I have very pleasant dreams, by the way. <laughs> very, very pleasant. Very. And uh, the, but the thought that comes to mind is the mind where my dreams come from, they're generated from my mind. And this phenomenon is created, generated from my mind. My mind. <clears throat> so back up the word my mind the mind <laughs> this organism the sense organism is constantly uh active and in in practice i pull away from it and just at times the suchness of the thing oh yes wow but it, I guess because the dream comes from that state between the years or between, okay, there you go. I love, it. love your faces. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to like this. Okay, so now. <laughs> but I guess the point is uh, it, it's, it, it, it's a very funny, funny thing, the mind or a mind for this phenomenon. It's quite amusing. I'm so happy I have pleasant, that there are pleasant experiences in my, in this phenomenon when I'm sleeping. <laughs> so Noe. Yes. Uh, Manjushri has a question for you. Do you see that mind? Is it therefore this mind that attains awakening? So I'm no. reiterating the last part mm -hmm. of the sutra that cool. we just read, which brings up this very idea of the mind. Mm -hmm. What I was going to respond before I noted how apropos your question was to the sutra, I was going to comment mm, the idea that there is a mind comes from the idea that there is something to be mindful of it's it's like thinking you have eyes because you're seeing things well i must be seeing them somehow and isn't it that 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 happens in a dream we see things therefore we imagine we have eyes in a dream but our eyes are closed yet we still see and Notice, we want to notice that in a dream, when we think we see, we think we have eyes. Likewise, when we think, we think there's a mind thinking. So along these lines, Manjushri asks again, the Bodhisattva, so this mind, uh, you know, that we're talking about in that way. Do you see that mind? Is it therefore that mind that attains awakening? And Lion Courage Bodhisattva replies, no, Manjushri. Why? Because mind is without form and cannot be seen. So this is a well-established Buddhist understanding that the mind is formless. It does not have 
a color or a shape or a size. It doesn't make noise. It doesn't give off an odor. You cannot touch it. And in a way you can't even think about it. It is formless. So Bodhisattva Lion Courage says, no, no, because the mind is without form and cannot be seen. Bodhi awakening is also like this. Just being the perception of a name. If mind is just a word and awakening is just a word, then they totally do not exist. Manjushri says, excellent, excellent noble one. As you said, I did not give rise to a single thought of attaining awakening. There's a secret intent to me saying this. There's a secret meaning to me saying this. What is it? Because the mind originally has not arisen. For this reason, there is no arising. As there is no being arisen, what could attain what realization? <laughs> so right there, <laughs> we have basically, I've you know, I, I took away all the dharmas, I took away all the phenomena, individuated entities, and then got down to even these, we could say shunyata, emptiness, is just a word. Mind is just a word, awakening. These are all just words that don't exist in the slightest. And then this subtle secret meaning that Manjushri says, because the mind originally has not arisen, for this reason, there is no arising. So what they're talking about is the arising of a particular state of mind, like being angry or what have you, or even what Noe was talking about regarding the mind in a dream, the mind that is having a dream. Manjushri says the mind originally has not arisen. And let me, let me just... <clears throat> May, try to make this simple. So remember, remember my clock <laughs> and we went through this exercise where I tried to point out that the idea of a clock is an idea that is in a way being projected onto what you think is an individuated object in my hand. And as we peeled away the imputed characteristics, as we peeled away all of these things, and I kept asking this interesting question, what is a clock? What are we calling a clock? And if I did that all correctly, and we really came to an understanding of the empty nature of the clock, we actually understand there is no clock. Is everybody with me on there not being a clock? So then, if we understand that, does it make sense to talk about when this clock was manufactured? <clears throat> what clock was manufactured? Does it make sense to talk about this clock being destroyed? Like breaking and falling apart and not existing anymore? Well, no, it, there isn't a clock to go out of existence. So if you understand how emptiness implies that there was no clock to have arisen, no clock to cease, 
If you get that, and you understand why that logic applies to all individuated phenomena, the mind is an individuated phenomena. Perhaps I individuated as my mind, distinct from your mind, but it's a differentiation. And Manjushri has been telling us about the problems of differentiation, about that type of uh, discrimination in that way. And so because the mind originally has not arisen, for this reason, there's no arising. As there is no arising or no being arisen, what could attain what realization? This is Manjushri's answer to why he's not seeking awakening, why he isn't awakened now, why he hasn't made a vow to become awakened. There is no mind to make a realization to be awakened. So let me, I'm going to, yeah, we, we might get back to the sutra, but I want to kind of conclude a few ideas that I left hanging out there. So now, I can kind of introduce in a little more detail this third door of liberation, apranihita, no pranihita, apranihita. So apranihita is a, a desire, a, but it's a little deeper. It's not a desire like for a, a, um, a goodie. It's not like a little desire. Pranihita is like the desire to get awakened. <laughs> like it's almost, and actually even linguistically, pra, pranihita, it's re related to making vows, like vowing to do something. So it's like a big desire, not just a little desire. But a pranihita means aimlessness. That term, apranihita, aimlessness, it, it's a really subtle idea. And it, I'm going to talk about it more in future nights. I just want to introduce it now because it'll make sense of this idea. So something to keep in mind about apranihita and pranihita. So making these kinds of vows. So the idea here is, is that the Buddha identified a source of suffering, the source of suffering, causes of suffering. And it's this idea of wanting and craving, yes, but in particular, it's about being dissatisfied with the current situation and feeling as if the current situation needs changing, meaning I, that something needs to happen in order for me to either be pleased, in order for me to be having a better time, or in order for me to be not having as bad a time. You, you take your pick of how you want to think about that. But the idea here is, is that the Buddha has always sort of been encouraging us to be here now with this idea of we, par pardon the use of that idea of the self, but we, we stir ourselves out of an enlightened state. We stir ourselves out of nirvana with wanting the situation to be other than it is in any way, better than it is, not as bad as it is, whatever it is. It's a kind of a, a seeking, a wanting, and, a, and all of that. All of that is pranihita. A pranihita is desirelessness, aimlessness. It's a kind of purposelessness. And at first, 
when you hear about this teaching about a door of liberation is aimlessness. At first, that seems very counterintuitive until you start examining pursuit, the nature of pursuit, the nature of seeking and striving. And in particular, in particular, the idea of setting up a goal and being like, yeah, as soon as I have that amount of money, then I'll be happy. That way of thinking, the way of thinking that sets up a imaginary reality and says, that's the one. This is not that. And I got to get to that. That is a major problem. <laughs> and so just to give you a, a little uh, example, just a, a little uh, Buddha, Buddha approved metaphor. Most of you have heard this one before. There is a analogy that the Buddha gives. And he talks about, everybody's heard this one. He talks about somebody being lost in the woods and they don't know which way is north, which way is south. And it's a cloudy night and it's a new moon. So no stars, no light, can't see anywhere. We are totally lost. So it could so happen that somebody comes along and I ask them, hey, which way's north? And they say, oh, that way. And I go, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm no longer lost because I have attained knowledge of which way is north. And I attained that knowledge from you. Now I, I'm on my way. Thanks. Okay. So that is one way to get unlost by learning which way is north, south, east, and west. There's another way to become unlost. And what the Buddha says is the moment the person doesn't care where they're going, they're no longer lost. So notice that the state of being lost is self-created. And so it's a beautiful liberation to realize that we can undo that ourselves without relying on another. So notice that in my first example, I relied upon someone else to tell me some information. And then that's how I got unlost. And that's how most religions work. That there's some information about God or Jesus or Allah or whoever. There's some information that you don't have. And if you get it, you'll be saved. You'll be found, right? You'll no longer be lost because the imam or the priest or the rabbi or the whoever gave me the knowledge and I'm now saved. Again, that's one way to become unlost. But there's this interesting other way, which is to just no longer care where you're going. Now, we're not talking about being lost in the woods. We're talking about being lost in life. We're talking about not knowing what the purpose is of what the purpose is here. Which way should I be going? Should I be trying to make a lot of money? Should I be trying to have experiences? Like, what should I be doing here? I'm totally lost. <laughs> Somebody could come along and give you the meaning of life and point you 
in the right direction of what you should do with your life. That would be one way to do it. The Buddha is talking about actually this striving and this needing for purpose in one's life. <laughs> and the idea here, which is that we are creating all of those conditions that set up our own suffering in that way. Just like I said, that if you set up the criteria that this amount of money is happiness, just remember you set up that criteria. Nobody forced you to set that criteria that money equals happiness. So if you're thinking that that is the way to do it, and then you're, you're frustrated because you don't have that amount of money, just remember, you're the one that created the, the criteria. And you can just as easily uncreate that criteria, if that makes sense. OK, so that's a kind of quick thing about the teaching of apranihita, this aimlessness, but again, it specifically is about striving, seeking in that way that thinks the grass is greener over there. And I'm hoping that all of these things combined, the emptiness, the characteristiclessness, and this aimlessness, I'm hoping that you see how all three of those are working together to bring us much more deeply into what could be called provisionally the present moment. Right? And noticing there's a lot of things being heaped on top of the present moment that are confusing us in that way. So, okay, I'm going to call it there. I hope that I hope that helped a little bit. Um, any last questions, comments, answers, ideas? All right, that'll awesome. do it. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any announcements, Michael? Um, I don't. Just the normal that I'll be here every Sunday night doing the Dharma doors. And uh, I'm sure you'll put in the chat the links to my SoundCloud. Um, I am about to post a new uh, SoundCloud tomorrow. So if you follow me on SoundCloud, uh, look for that tomorrow. What's, what's it going to be about? Um, it's going to be, I've been doing a series for my SoundCloud of recitations. I've been reading a bunch of the really important older suttas. And so this month I'm doing the famous fire sermon the that all is burning sermon which is a it's a pretty important one about the six senses and about burning with desire so ah okay i was wondering when you was like all is burning i'm like yeah oh, burning with that? desire <laughs> okay so yeah. all right awesome that thank sounds you. really really cool to check out thank you mm -hmm.